Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Allow me to extend a very warm well welcome to all of you who are joining us today. We are delighted to have you across so many time zones and continents. Dzień dobry, dobry wieczór, witamy Państwa bardzo serdecznie i cieszymy się, że tak wielu z Państwa dołączyło się do nas. Let me first welcome our distinguished guests, Judge Rasuli and Judge Parsa, the crisis team members from the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Szymon Kurzawa and Ms. Karolina Smaga, Ms. Nigara Omar, the deputy senior diplomat from the Afghan Embassy in Warsaw, and Mecenas Anja Kruszewska, the Polish lawyer who is the key to the events we will describe today. We are delighted and very grateful to have all for to all of you for accepting our invitation to speak today. My name is Elizabeth Zahenter. I am a visiting scholar at the Emory University, president of the Jagiellonian Law Society, board member of the Philadelphia chapter of the Kościuszko Foundation, and member of American Bar Association. I will be your moderator today. Today, webinar tells a story of a rescue that came about in a very unconventional way via a tweet from one woman, one woman in Afghanistan facing dire future, answered by another woman in a completely different part of the world who decided to do something about it, about this unfolding tragedy. And it's a story about the Polish government who actually agreed to do something about it too. And finally, it is a story of the brave female judges of Afghanistan whose lives were disrupted so suddenly and tragically. So far, this story has not been told publicly because Polish government was asked to keep the story quiet in order to save as many judges and women lawyers as possible. And they kept their word and they haven't. But the stories of other rescues are being told now in press and various lectures. And therefore it is time to share this amazing story with you. Now, when the United States decided to withdraw from Afghanistan, thousands of Afghans, especially women, judges, lawyers, or any other professionals, found themselves in grave danger from the approaching Taliban forces. And the withdrawal was hectic, it was rushed, the Taliban forces were advancing much faster than expected, and not everybody who was asked to help the evacuation decided to help. Afghanistan had roughly 270 women judges and lawyers, uh, judges, roughly half of them were able to be evacuated, many others still remain. These women were the key enemy of Taliban as they represent everything the Taliban wants to suppress education and agency of women, their basic human rights in the name of the so-called tradition, which is sadly nothing more than the extreme and unbalanced interpretation of a far more complex and rich history of the people of Afghanistan. The structure of this seminar is two part. Since we want to tell you a story and we want to tell you, give you the arc of the story, it is a complex story, and to do it justice, we have arranged the order of speaker to follow the arc of the events. So we will start with two representatives of the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we are very fortunate to have with us two people who made it all happen in real time. Their talk will give you overview what happened in days before the fall of Kabul. That talk will be followed by Mecenas Anna Kruszewska, Polish attorney who originated the action to save Afghan women judges. And Anna's talk will be followed by talks by two Afghan judges, Judge Anissa Rasuli and Judge Parsa. We will finish with the remark from the deputy head of mission and senior diplomat, Ms. Nigara Omar, and we will talk about the future of women and the road ahead. I will introduce each speaker before their talk. After their talk, we will hold Q&A session so please use the chat function and submit the questions to me. I will collate those questions and I will ask them. Now, events like the one today take many people and much collaboration. So allow me to thank so many institutions and people for their help and contribution to make this webinar possible. First of all, I want to thank Jagiellonian Law Society, the board and the membership for their organic support to various initiatives. My deep thanks go to Kościuszko Foundation, including the Philadelphia chapter and especially the main office, starting with Vice President Mark Skulimowski for his ongoing support, to Eva Zadvorna, Vice President of Cultural Affairs, who actually made it all happen, and the fabulous Kościuszko Foundation team, 
starting from the graphic designer, Ms. Margaret Kozłowska, who designed the beautiful graphic dress for the seminar, and the entire team, including okay. Orvat, and all ladies who make sure that the website, the registration, the brochure, the uh -huh. IT side of it worked. Finally, this program is also produced in cooperation with American Bar Association. And I want to give special thanks to Nancy Stafford, chair of the International Law Section. I want to thank, thank two co-chairs of Women Interest Network, Karen, uh, Katrin Van Kampen and Dana Katz, and the chairs of International Human Rights Committee, Corinne Lewis and Wendy Tauby for their support, their edits, and all other contributions. With that, allow me to introduce you two very key persons who made it all happen, Mr. Shimon Kujeva and Ms. Karolina Smaga. Mr. Shimon Kujeva is a Council of Crisis Coordinator at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the, uh, of Poland, and he is a career diplomat. He is graduate of the Imperial College of London and so as University of London. Formally, he worked as a cor in corporate sector as a business consultant and supply chain analyst, very, very appropriate. And since 2017, he works for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Poland. Um, he served as a vice counsel for the Polish embassy in Beijing. And since 2020, he is consular cri crisis uh, coordinator for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he is the one who coordinated the evacuation from Afghanistan in August of 2021. But he has dealt with many other crises, abductions, terrorists, criminal kidnappings, and he evacuated many people from many places, including, for example, Polish citizens from Wuhan and so forth. From what I hear, he is passionate about finance and technology. So welcome. The second uh, person whom we have a privilege to speak with is Karolina Smaga. She is a lawyer and she is counsel in the consular department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Poland and also member of the crisis management team who worked on this evacuation. She is career diplomat and alumni of the University of Warsaw and the Paris Two Pantheon Asso uh, Association. She has worked formally at White Tail Case as an associate and since 2009, she works at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Among her many functions, she served as a vice counsel in the Polish embassy in Athens, in Paris, and in fact, she was the head of the consular sex section of the Polish embassy in, in Paris. She coordinated many actions uh, before and uh, is extremely experienced, and she is one of the persons who were on the ground during the Afghan administration. So with that, let me introduce to you Ms. Shimon Kujava and Karolina Smaga, and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. We would like to thank you for the invitation for, to this event and um, for, your, for your kind hospitality. Uh, today, we'll be talking a little bit about the uh, evacuation from Afghanistan. Uh, some people call it uh, Operation L, like a group of lawyers that we evacuated. Some people call it Operation Bridge 2. Uh, in fact, it doesn't have any formal name, so you can call it whatever you want, whatever suits you. Uh, today uh, with me uh, is Ms. Carolina Smaga, uh, a member of a team uh, of the Consul Crisis team. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Carolina was responsible mainly for logistics uh, during these hard days. Uh, my name is Shimon Kujava, and I'm a crisis coordinator at the Polish MFA. Um, well, so we've introduced ourselves. Let's proceed to the presentation. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the conditions uh, uh, before the operation started. Uh, we had extremely short time span uh, from before the time, from, from before the decision was taken. Uh, and primarily, uh, the, the operation, the whole operation was aimed to evacuate several Polish citizens. Uh, shortly after, uh, we decided to, to um, include uh, some um, former employees of the Polish embassy, uh, former employees, translators, interpreters of the Polish military units there in Afghanistan uh, in the name of solidarity. And quickly we realized that uh, this operation would not end up with some, I don't know, 20 people. The total number of evacuated uh, of evacuees was more than 1,000, 1,200, I guess. I think, yeah. 
Yes, because um, the we could not leave the the families of these people alone. So we have to we had to uh, consider them on our planes. In total, we had around um, 50, 60 flights, shuttle flights from Afghanistan, from Kabul to Nawai. And from Nawai to uh, Warsaw, we organized another set of shuttle flights, uh, in total 15, I guess. Uh, there were civilian flights uh, taking people directly to Warsaw. Um, so the logistics were pretty difficult. We had to organize everything within literally hours. Yeah. We had to like pay, one afternoon, I think. One afternoon or something like that. Yeah, we had to pay pave our tracks uh, uh, from like just basically organizing airplanes, the the, the physical planes, to signing uh, international agreements with uh, Uzbekistan uh, and so on and so on. So there was uh, a lot of hassle, but luckily we we managed to do everything on time. And no one was left alone, and we're quite happy. We can call this success, I guess. Yeah. We agree fairly now. <laughs> right. So, so yeah, agree. <laughs> <laughs> apart, from, apart from logistics, we had to uh, think of some safety measures. That's why we, together with our consuls, uh, we also included uh, some military staff uh, to take care of the physical safety, uh, both at the airplane and on the ground in Kabul. <clears throat> The other thing we had to take on account uh, was uh, basically flow of information, uh, some IT uh, systems that we had to think of, radios, satellite phones, and so on. Uh, we don't have to mention that in Kabul, the, the, the general conditions were pretty harsh, and not always the radios or, or the satellites or GSM systems were quite reliable. So we had to improvise from time to time. One of the major challenges was uh, a short time from uh, the gathering point to to the actual flight, because when people reached the airport, uh, they had only around 40, 45 minutes to, to get on board and, uh, and fly away. So uh, yes, as as we started our base operation, um, several new challenges uh, appeared. And um, Carolina will tell you a little bit more about just basic logistics uh, uh, challenges, such as lack of uh, medication, such as lack of uh, what was the name of that uh, sanitary, sanitary. Yeah, the equipment. first need, uh, first need, uh, uh, first need stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, because there, there was, um, here in Poland, I was uh, not only responsible uh, with uh, Simon to, 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 to do some work of evacuation and to do the list of uh, evacuated people from Afghanistan, I was also um, obliged to organize some kind of uh, logistical, logistical um, uh, assistance, such as portrait, buying uh, kind of, uh, as we said, uh, first need products like uh, some tampon, tampons, uh, some wipes, wipes, wipes yeah, and, so and medicines because uh, the, 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 there was no such a thing uh, in uh, in Kabul. They were, I think that they they they, they were told to. <laughs> That the action evacuation of uh, from Afghanistan was uh, uh, foreseen for some kind of two days. Uh, yeah, and they the, the initial plan was one or two days uh, yeah, and to have everything sorted and just leave the ground. Uh, in, it took uh, some kind of two weeks, I think. At, at the end of the day, it took two weeks. So uh, basically, we were not ready. Oh, so yes, yeah, so we needed to send all these uh, products, all those products to Navoy and after to to Kabul. And they were redistributed to Kabul. Uh, so, yes, uh, for Afghan people and for staff. Uh, Basically, uh, it was meant to to be distributed among our people because uh, like war, like. Uh, as, as we said, was, yeah. yeah, it was done for two days, so we had to supply additional work, uh, other supplies, uh, food, uh, some, I don't know, snacks, and so on. But uh, obviously, there were so many people there, 
uh, that needed to be taken care of. Uh, our people, see after like immediately when, when they saw those starving people, starving, tired people, they just start sharing the food. So the needs obviously increased and we had to supply uh, foods for, I don't know, more or less 100 people a day. That was super difficult, but we, we made it basically. Uh, there were hundreds of women, some uh, expecting babies. Yes. Uh, but yeah, after all, everything was fine. But lack of wheel transportation. Uh, in a minute, you will see what I'm talking about. And the Abbey Gate as well. So let's proceed. This is what the Abbey Gate looked like. Uh, this is the spaces between the checkpoint. Uh, I'll walk you through the checkpoints later on. But as you can see, we dealt with huge numbers of people. Uh, here's the picture of, um, of basically the airport. Uh, as you can see, um, people uh, at the Abigail had to uh, pass through several checkpoints. They were stuffed with Taliban uh, guards, and it was quite difficult to, to, to pass through them because many, many people were stopped by Taliban, and some of them were refused to, to go further. Uh, after, hmm, let me skip to the other slide. Yeah, after uh, around four kilometers from the entrance to the Abbey Gate, um, they were uh, led to the uh, the Barnes Barnes Hotel, and from the Barnes Hotel they were moved to the uh, to the tents where our staff, our crew, was initially initially like identifying them. Uh, and were presenting security checks. And after that, they were uh, gathered uh, near the tarmac where, where the planes landed. And then they were grouped and put on the planes. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, here's uh, the conditions of, of our temporary accommodations of, of our crew. As you can see, it's quite cozy. <laughs> Uh, this is our car. So basically, um, when we, when our people arrived in Afghanistan, we had no means of transportation on the ground. Uh, quickly after, we had we realized we need some sort of uh, bus or or anything that has four wheels uh, to enable transportation of the of the Afghans that were both tired and uh, they needed some. Oh, exhausted. Some, they were exhausted and need some. Some form of transportation was required by uh, by the authorities at the airport. Uh, so our our guys acquired this lorry. Uh, uh, it might look funny, but it was quite reliable. Uh, I would say impeccable because it hadn't uh, hadn't broken a single time. So that was super. That was a great car, Toyota. Mm, right. Uh, this is what the on-site uh, condition looked like at, at the tents. This is the place where these people were interviewed, uh, verified, um, the, document, the documents were checked, uh, and their identity, and so on. So they were, uh, they were fed there, and they were given the, the first care. So the whole process looked uh, as on the slide. And uh, from the extraction uh, from from the Abbey Gate, which was one of the most difficult yeah. steps, mm -hmm. as you can, see, you will see later on the photos how difficult it was to to identify to extract these people from uh, from the sewer, from the actual sewer. Uh, then they were of course verified. Um, our our staff had to check their say, uh, had to make some, had to do some uh, security check. Uh, because obviously people with any like dangerous uh, items weren't allowed to the airport even the safety then uh, these people were uh, marked and put on our on our lorry little lorry that you already know uh, then they were transported to the tents uh, they were receiving further care uh, <clears throat> some further verification some interviewing uh, by our interpreters and then they were prepared for for the takeoff and finally they would fly to Novoi 
wait in the hallway for another plane to Warsaw and finally uh, flying away to Warsaw. Well, in collaboration with our uh, with other ministries, such as uh, Ministry of Interior, uh, the Prime Minister Chancellery, uh, as well as border guards, they were received. They were given the proper care. Um, they were uh, moved to some temporary accommodation. This is what the process looked like. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk much about team division and so on, but we have. Uh, we want to tell you that. We sent uh, a group of people uh, that had to rotate because uh, their activities were exhausting. Uh, extraction at the Abbey Gate or interviewing or other logistical activities. They were super, super uh, exhausting because of the temperature there, because of the conditions, lack of proper sanitary means. Uh, they had to rotate, they had to change the shifts. So basically they had to be separate into several teams uh, that could manage all those activities. And of course, we were very grateful uh, for the support of our allies, like the US soldiers, uh, the British soldiers, uh, Germans, Turks, and many other na nations that were present there, as well as French colleagues, and so on and so on. Sorry for not mentioning everyone, but there's is, there is a huge network of, uh, of people who, who are actually collaborating with each other. And because of that collaboration, everyone was able to succeed. Not only in Afghanistan, but also in Uzbekistan. Yeah, yes. that was exactly, exactly. Yeah. So further challenges included uh, the constant changes on lists because some people um, who declared to go, uh, they did not appear. Some others uh, appeared, even though they were not at the list, but they claimed to be some family members of other people who were on the board and so on and so on. So it was super difficult to actually identify those people. Uh, they had, our team members had to make quick decisions and super stressful decisions. Sometimes they were forced to say no to someone who, who actually had no links with Poland or with the people who, who were on our list. Um, so there was a huge uh, psychological pressure. Um, that was super difficult for them. Uh, I mean, really difficult. Um, and I don't think like anyone would like to be in their, in their shoes. Some of them had no documents. Yeah. Yes, and they had to come up with some forms of verification, even if the people with that document appeared. Uh, we collaborated, we in the headquarters collaborated closely with them. So if we had access to some documents, uh, some traces of the people who collaborated with the Polish military uh, contingency, such as like interpreters and so on, mm -hmm. uh, we were asking the Ministry of Defense uh, if they had any documents. Um, and just the birth certificate or something. Exactly. Like so we had to come up with quick uh, forms, quick uh, processes, uh, just to take as many people on board as possible. Um, right. And as the time went by uh, at the Abbey Gate, um, the, the, the general conditions uh, deteriorated quickly. Uh, there were many people uh, crowding. Some, from time to time, the Taliban just refused to let people in. Uh, sometimes uh, there were threats of terrorist attacks, and unfortunately, a few of them happened uh, close to the end of the operation. But um, as you probably know from the media, the situation there was really, really tough. Many people were trampled to death, uh, there were many incidents. Uh, also, our, our team members, our military, our consuls were constantly under threat, under the severe security risks. Um, they were they're really aware of that. Uh, we tried to assist them as much as possible, but obviously uh, you're not there, so you can't do much. Mm, you can imagine what they felt on the ground, but they really were driven, I'd say, driven to help those people. And they did not actually feel that much stress of uh, 
being threatened, they do not feel like in danger, right? They don't, they, 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 yeah. Even when we talk to them, uh, with our skin, they did not show any signs of like being afraid. They're just there, you know, trying to help uh, the Afghans. Here are the pictures uh, of the sewer uh, uh, where the people were extracted from. Uh, together with some other uh, military. And you can imagine these people uh, at the sewer, they had to walk through steps, like uh, three, four kilometers in yes, such conditions. Uh, as you can see, there is a Polish, or uh, I think, yeah, po Polish flag. Uh, there's, yeah, Polish flag, upside down, yeah. but uh, yeah. Even, yeah, as a, uh, as a kind of uh, it, to be extracted from this uh, sewage, yeah. So uh, there are several signs uh, like Polish flag, like like PL, uh, done by the, from the from the from the finger, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. some gestures, some signs. So we had to come up with uh, quick forms of communication with the guys we've never seen. Yeah. Uh, and to identify them quickly. We had to sort of popularize this method, and it worked pretty well because uh, some people on the ground were uh, in touch with the Afghans via WhatsApp, for example. Yeah, but we um, had to change it. Uh... And we had to change the size quite regularly because, uh, <laughs> as you know, the news spread quite quickly. Some people try to pretend they have some of and so on, so they use those gestures. So we rotated them like daily or twice a day. But overall, the system worked pretty well and was quite efficient. I don't think anyone uh, came up with such a system that quickly. Yeah. Uh, here's a picture from the sewer at night. Uh, as you can see, those horrible, horrible conditions. But the military, uh, our team members, and other country, like the military from other countries, were working there day and night uh, trying to extract as many people as possible. Uh, consider. Right, so you can see outside Poland, other guys had this card, paper sheet with saying Polish. Uh, right, so I mentioned the remote communication, how our people sent those gestures to the, uh, to the Afghans. Uh, of course, uh, that um, many people had their families and the families were pretty, uh, pretty large. Some people had some from five 15, to ten children. Even fifteen. Fifteen would together with I remember one family had like ten children, five grandchildren, and so on. So um, uh, so basically we had to uh, appoint local coordinators, uh, like a head of the family or someone appointed by the head of the family uh, was uh, a coordinator that was in touch with uh, our consuls. And because of such direct communication, they were able to assist them through uh, the whole way. Uh, they knew where the, the Afghans are located, and because of that, they can react quickly. Uh, for example, when I don't know the, the checkpoint was closed or something like that. So they were able to, to assist. Also, uh, they were able to inform Brits or the American soldiers uh, our locations of our people so they could help us and many, many more. This is how the uh, one of the steps uh, of our journey looked like. People were getting on the truck. Um, some of them were given the best so we could quickly identify the people who were verified. Then they were escorted and transported to the tents. Right, yes, yeah, so one of the checkpoints. Uh, uh, one night uh, when uh, mm. the security alert was pretty uh, pretty serious, uh, and all the checkpoints closed, and a group of people, uh, quite numerous group of people, uh, stopped uh, just in front uh, of the gate to the airport near the Barnes Hotel, but they were not able to, to get in because. Um, well, because of the security alert, uh, there was a threat that someone might have some uh, dangerous items. So they had to be checked, verified, and so on. 
uh, the alarm lasted more than one night. So these people had to wait um, there in the sun. And uh, some of the women uh, needed an emergency help, like the, the women you can see, but for little children, uh, they needed some work, some medicine, some assistance. Uh, our council, our military had to get in the airport, grab some necessities and get out to the danger zone just to provide uh, foods, uh, medicals, uh, and other, other medical uh, help and other, uh, other stuff to, the, to these people. So they're risking, basically they're risking their lives just to help those uh, women and those kids. Here's what it looks like at night. I can see tired soldiers just taking some naps. Well, I don't think that requires any, any comment. Well, yeah, uh, sometimes we manage to get people in uh, on convoys, convoys. Uh, one of the one of the convoys you can see as the IMF's convoy uh, organized by IMF, and many lawyers from your group were actually on this convoy. And thanks to the IMF's help, uh, thanks to the Pakistani embassy's help, uh, collaboration of our minister and Pakistani ambassador and local uh, Pakistani authorities. We were able to to get people at, to the airport without uh, without uh, having to cross the, uh, the the Abbey Gate. So they basically avoided all the hassle. Uh, I don't remember the number of lawyers uh, that were on, on on those buses, but I guess it's pretty significant group. So you can see uh, the actual cars uh, they were traveling. And yeah, after two weeks, uh, the operation ended. Uh, our last plane took off several, I know, se several quarters before the, the major, the major terrorist strike, uh, where many people died. Uh, this is what it looked like after the operation, when all those military from all those countries left. Uh, the picture on the right is quite. Uh, Notorious, uh, you can see the the cart. Um, there's just nothing left. So uh, I guess that's it from my side. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you might have. You can write us on. You can find it on email, on LinkedIn, or whatever. Uh, or you can ask uh, Miss Anna uh, about our our email addresses. Uh, Caroline, would you like, like to add something? No, just uh, say thanks to our ministry to give me such a support opportunity to, to work for this um, uh, special operation. Yeah, that was very uh, valuable experience yeah. on my side as well. So, yeah, thank you once again. Have a good day. Uh, have a good time like, listening to this, uh, to this presentation. And yeah, all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both. Yeah, no, I, I just want to I want to thank you, commend you for everything you did. I speak for all of us here. We are incredibly grateful for what you have done. It was an amazing action. And thank you so very much. Thank you for joining us today. I know that you have to go because you have other engagements, but we are very grateful for joining and more importantly for what you have done. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you for your you. hospitality. We'll pass the thank you words to, to our team members and to many, many more people that were involved. But we're really happy we could just, you know. Uh, yes. And please say, do not forget, let me not forget to thank the Polish soldiers who actually left the gate and took the risk of going and extracting people just to save those Afghan women judges and went to the crowd and took the risk of, you know, terrorist attack and whatever. Thank, please thank them from us very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot and good luck with the presentation. I know it will be great. We'll see the replay after we're done with our publication. Thank you so much. So thank thanks a lot. Have a good day and bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.
so with that, um, I am gonna now introduce to you our next speaker. And this is Anna Kruszewska, an attorney, a partner in a boutique firm of Hasse, Grimes and Partners. And she's professionally an excellent lawyer and a lawyer who is specializing in intellectual property law, copyright law, media law, protection of personal rights law, technology law. She is a deeply accomplished attorney with high, you know, who participated in many high profile lawsuits and represented many high profile people, among them, for example, the family of Władysław Spielmann. Those of you who saw the movie Pianist know his story. He was a very famous pianist, Polish Jewish origin. Uh, she also represented daughter of the former president Kwaśniewski, and she represented them in cases involving their privacy and their reputation. She advises on many other things. For example, she advises producers of computer games in Poland. She's lecturer uh, in the Polish Chamber of Pattern Attorneys. She publishes uh, you know, legal commentaries. And she is the recipient of the Rising Star awarded to as a star of the Polish legal profession by LexisNexis, which we all know. She is a graduate of the law department of the Warsaw University, of course, summa cum laude. We couldn't expect anything less. She also has a law degree from Cardiff University from United Kingdom. And she took courses in the, for the Center for English and European Laws organized by University of Cambridge, as well Center for American Law organized with Faculty of Law at the University of Florida. And Anya is here not only because she's an accomplished attorney, actually not because she's an accomplished attorney, but because she's the initiator of the evacuation of Afghan judges. And she's the woman who started it all. Um, she consulted with the International Association of Women Judges. She talked to the ministry and she organized the whole thing to happen. She, she made the whole thing happen. She hasn't stopped doing all those charitable deeds. She runs currently a group of informal group of lawyers. They call themselves Legal Aid. It's about 100 lawyers from was so from many, many firms. And they are right now helping the refugees from Ukraine. Among others, they are supporting children from the Ukrainian orphanages. And um, Anya is a versatile woman. And Anya, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for all these beautiful words. Thank you so much. I would like to thank the Yagelan Law Society, Kristiufka Foundation, uh, for having me here today but mostly you, Elizabeth, because you are initiative of today's event and without you, the world would not know about this event. So thank you so much. Thank you, Anya. And <laughs> there's a lot of things to say about events from last August. And I would like to share as many relevant details as possible, but I know that our time, our audience time is limited. So let me focus on the most important, I believe the most important moments of, um, of the story. Uh, and, let, and let me share a little presentation that I prepared for today. Let me start from here. Um, so as you heard, I'm a lawyer. My regular job has nothing to do with human crises as humans and Carolina uh, job is, but I'm amazed with their job. And my part of the story is a bit more, I would say personal and irregular in the same time. The first slide I want to show you is why we call it Operation L, which is one of many names of this operation. It's because of the L sign that you can do with two fingers, which was, which was used by Polish soldiers to recognize, extract from the crowd those who are on Polish um, evacuation list. But um, this story ends uh, a bit earlier, of course. We have those terrible pictures of people uh, fleeing from Afghanistan, trying to evacuate in a very dramatic conditions and surrounding. I'm, I'm certain that you remember that in August last year, we also terrible, dramatic pictures from Afghanistan. Well, for world, westward, but also Afghan citizens were trying to leave immediately Afghanistan before Taliban will take over 
of the country. And I remember myself coming back from very nice holidays in beautiful Italy just to watch the news and see these pictures. And it was a terrifying experience to me. And watching this news, I came across to the tweet with a link um, of an interview, interview given by young and brave judge, Afghan female judge, judge Tayyaba Pasa, who is here with us. And Tayyaba was brave enough, extremely brave, to publicly and under her own name and her picture, with her picture, say to the world that if the Taliban take Kabul, she, she will die. And she mentioned not only her, she meant not only her, but other Afghan female judges. And I remember reading this and it shocked me. It shocked me so much and deeply as, as I even didn't imagine could, that could happen. And I remember short thought, not on my watch. And I felt very, very angry for Taliban and for, and I was angry for everything that was going on and that we as the so-called Western world, we disappointed Afghan female judges. So I was thinking what, what can be done for Afghan female uh, judges? And I learned that there is 250 Afghan female judges, that this is like a, more or less 10 percentage of this profession. And two of them has been already killed in January last year. And having that in mind, and after talking with a few of my uh, lawyer friends, we decided that maybe we could set up some help because this was the moment when, when Polish evacuation mission has been set up and it seems to be very, it seemed to be very strong operation military wise. But to do that, first we need to convince Polish government that there are people there to, to rescue. We needed to be in touch with, uh, with the judges. And what I did to do that is actually, and please don't laugh, but this is the true story. I have contacted um, a judge, Romanian judge, who interviewed Taiba, and on LinkedIn, basically on LinkedIn, saying that we are trying in Poland to set up some kind of help and would he help us to connect to Taiba. And in the, the very same day, he had given me number, WhatsApp number of Taiba. Next day, we were connected, me in apartment in Warsaw and Taiba in Kabul. I also contacted a uh, um, journalist who interviewed Judge Anissa Razuli, who is here with us. Uh, it was Italian journalist. Um, and I, I sent him a very similar message. And the very next day, I received a message back from Susan Glazebrook, uh, the president of International Association of Women Judges, which is International Association who is trying to set up some kind of help for Afghan female judges. Susan contacted me saying, are you real? Is, is it, there something that Polish people can do for Afghan female judges? As at the time, it was very, very difficult to obtain any help to female judges, because as you probably know or can assume, everyone tried to desperately leave Afghanistan in like two weeks. It was, it was extremely now open, and those who were prioritized were those connected with foreign governments. The judges were not connected to any government, so they were not prioritized on any government lists. Uh, so what happened next uh, is that Polish government, especially Michał Wolczyk, the minister, Polish government, who was in charge of this very special operation, has decided that Polish mission will include Afghan female judges, not only include them, but prioritize them, as it was said before, because this group is particularly, was then particularly vulnerable to this situation. And from that moment, we set up a collaboration between Polish government, Polish forces, um, International Association of Women Judges, and Afghan judges. 
And by Afghan journalists, I especially mean Judge Tayeba, who became our communication officer. And through her, we can communicate with other judges. And that's how we managed to inform other judges that there is a way, there's a country who is willing to take them on board and take them out of Afghanistan. But this is one part of the story, which is getting all these puzzles together. The other one is to make things happen. And by making things happen, I'm talking about the judges getting to the airport, which was extremely, extremely dangerous to them. Not only because getting to the airport was, uh, the way to the airport was controlled by Taliban, but also that if they were recognized, they could face even death. So we are talking about this kind of uh, situation. Moreover, it wasn't easy to cross, uh, to get to the airport as Talib checkpoints were there. And usually Talibs were leaving those checkpoints only once a day at 4 a.m. where they, uh, they were praying. So most of the people were standing before these checkpoints all night just to squeeze in, sneak in to the part that has been controlled by American or British soldiers. So what was going on is that I was uh, receiving messages or calls from Polish authorities, people on the, <laughs> involved in an evacuation mission, as the one you heard just before, with messages saying that it's possible to uh, get to the airport at some time. And my job was to inform judges that they have to leave to the airport. And with all seriousness of this event and what I'm in my words, I'd like to say that there's no words that were more difficult for me to say than, than the one I had to say to each of the judges that were on the evacuation list when I was calling them, which was, are you ready to leave immediately? And the judges were packing themselves with very small bags, taking the closest ones who were also on the list and starting this very, very difficult road. And uh, maybe I will show you how the road looked like. There were crowds, as you see there, immense crowd. And it was very, very difficult to get just nearby the gate, which was and the wall that, is con that was uh, controlled by the, by the Polish soldiers as well. And these Polish soldiers to find people on the evacuation list needed to get into the crowd and find those on the list. As, as, and as you heard, there were special signs in case of a judges, a special sign was G, letter G as the judge. Sometimes it was PLG, so that should connect them with, uh, with Poland. Sometimes it was name of the, uh, of the Polish cities, anything that would enable Polish soldiers, Polish special force soldiers, uh, I mean, special task forces Grom, who were there, find judges in the crowd. Not only judges, because there are also other people on Polish evacuation list. I will name them later. So what I've been trying to do is to connect those who were going to the airport with the communication from Polish uh, authorities, and it was it connected a lot of sending information uh, very quickly, um, as communication is a key. In fact, in, in situations like this, when you know there is very narrow uh, narrow window for someone to get to Polish troops, so we are sending each other our locations. You have you have you see the example of such a location here. Uh, we, are ex we are exchanging messages. Some of those me messages as sound still in my head, some were very dramatic, like the one you can see on the, the right side, when someone has written me that he's like 100 feet from the, from the troops, but Taliban is not letting anyone in. And so it, it, it wasn't a trip to the airport. It was very difficult 
difficult road that in included a lot of barriers, life risking situation, a lot of determination. But the judges from the group that were listed on Polish list made it. They all made it. Not everyone in a, on the very on the very first time. Some of the judges had to try try to get to the Polish troops for three times. Some of them were getting the during 48, 72 hour uh, our walking distance, uh, a walking tour. So it was some of them had to leave because the children were falling. And then after hospitalization, they were back. Um, but uh, most import uh, importantly, no one was hurt by Talibs and everybody who was on the list did it. And um, the result of the Polish mission is that we have um, around 100, 200 people and one um, people evacuated, among them children, among them uh, lawyers, journalists, doctors, number of, of people with great education and skills. And also, um, also um, people who would probably uh, face very sad consequences of their pre activities if they stayed in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, what I would like to highlight is that, in fact, most of the people evacuated by Polish mission were not those who previously worked for Polish government, but they were citizens of other nations. They were, uh, they were workers of international money fund, workers of different organizations, judges, and so on. Mm, but this is not only a story today that I would like to share with you about beautiful evacuation, but this is also a story about friendship and about welcoming judges in Poland. And after the judges arrived, so after the judges arrived, they will welcome the Polish authorities. You can see here some pictures from an even special conference in prime minister office, where the judges were welcomed by Polish vice minister of foreign affairs, Mr. Marcin Przedecz, that I would like to personally thank for his involvement in this action and support for Afghan female judges. Um, except that the judges were also were also visiting a Polish Supreme Court and being uh, and there was a meeting with uh, President of Polish Supreme Court uh, and many many other occasions where I am hoping uh, the judges felt welcome by Polish citizens by authorities but also by other lawyers judges and professional colleagues. Um, the, one of the story about that is, uh, is, uh, is the picture that you can see here is a picture taken in Polish Bar Association that also came in to help Afghan female judges after then being, uh, they have been rescued, uh, as well as uh, Polish judges, number of lawyers, um, individuals, group in, of volunteers that together created beautiful community of people helping this group. And I'm very, very proud to be a member of this group. Um, also, we are still having the support from uh, Polish Prime Minister office that I would like to thank a lot today because they still, they, they funded a special program for Afghan female judges. And this program allows them to stay in, in good conditions, learn Polish and have the basic needs uh, met. So, and this program is still on this year. Um, but at the, at the very end, and the most importantly for me, this is a story about friend, friendship as well, as I believe we created beautiful bonds between, uh, between us. And I believe I personally gained great friends, not only me, but I would like to share this a little bit personal thing with you, as uh, I'm touched and honored to meet women, Afghan female judges, who are so brave, determined, and beautiful human beings that I am being inspired by since the day we met. Thank you.
Thank you, Anya. We are inspired by you too. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I will hold a question for you after we hear from our two distinguished female judges of from course. Afghanistan. So let me introduce you now to Judge Anissa Rasuli, who is the most prominent and most senior Afghan judge with an incredible reputation. And she was the first woman to be appointed to the Supreme Court of Afghanistan which is incredible achievement if you consider that. In the United States, we just went through the bruising confirmation for a female judge. And we know how hard it is for female judges to make it to the Supreme Court, even in the United States. But I cannot even imagine how hard it must have been for Judge Rasuli to, first of all, she was appointed. And my understanding is she lost by a very minor vote in the parliament. Judge Rasuli had many functions. Uh, she was the head of the Court of Appeals for Serious cri Crimes of Corruption. Most recently, she was appointed as a judicial advisor to the Afghan Supreme Court, and she's also the head of the Afghan Women Judges Association. Judge Rasuli is a graduate of Kabul University. She has degrees in law and political science, as well as master's in criminal justice, and she completed many other special courses. She began her career in the criminal division of the Afghan High Court and then became a judge in the Kabul Public Security Court. And Judge Rasuli has suffered from the hands of Taliban twice. Like all other female judges, she was removed from the judiciary by Taliban in 1996. And during that period, she didn't give up. She actually funded a school for girls. When the Taliban left after she was reinstated and she became the head of the Kabul Juvenile Court and later head of the Juvenile Appellate Court. That was followed by her appointment as the head of the Appellate Court Division for Serious Crimes of Corruption and she currently serves a judicial advisor to the Afghan Supreme Court for nonviolent offenders. In addition to her many judicial duties, she is active lecturer, she teaches Afghan constitutional law, women's rights law under Islam, juvenile justice law, international human law, family law, and criminal law. And uh, she serves on the commission drafting the new criminal code and to participate in many criminal reforms. Um, so with that, I would like to welcome Judge Rasuli. And uh, one comment here, Judge Rasuli will speak to us in Dari, although she speaks English, but she will give us her comments in Dari, and we will be showing simultaneously translation of her speech at the same time. So with that, Madam, the floor is yours. Judge Rasuli. Thank you so much. و می خواهیم بگم که تایبه جان اگر ترجمه کنی که واقعا این تصاویر و این وضعیت که دوباره از طرف عبدالت ماجرین و از طرف خانمان ها بر ما نشان داده شد واقعا مرا به ما حالت و وضعیت نو ما قبل بود واقعا می احساس کردم که در اطراف میدان نوایی هستم و به همون قدر مشکلات uh, Judge Tayeba, you are, we cannot hear you, you are on mute. Uh, no, uh, before her speech, she wanted to add something. Uh, she said uh, the pictures and photos from the Kabul's airport that, uh, judge, that the, Ms. Anna shared uh, was so... Um, impressing and she remembered the situation that nine months ago she was there and uh, it was it was so sad she felt again that uh, she was there and she remembered again the situation the hard tough uh, time that we had قبل از مزار سپاس و قدردانی می کنم از انجمن حقوقی یگلونی و بنیاد کوشیشک و کشور پلند که در این متنگ بنده را شامل ساخته و زمین صحبت و ابراز نظر برای فراهم شده است. 
قاضی انسا رسولی یک یک تن از قضات زن افغانستان هستم البته قاضی کشوری که ما زنان با مبارزه و تحمل هزاران مشکلات و ناملایمات زندگی به این مسند رسیده بودیم و با علاقه مندی و پلی که به مسلک قضا داشتیم با تمام نیرو و توان تلاش کردیم صادقانه و شجاعانه خدمت کنیم و با امیدی که بتوانیم با ایجاد یک انگیزه مثبت برای امروز و فردای بهتر قضات زن در سیستم قضایی برنامه ریزی کرده تا در تامین عدالت و تحکیم قانونیت دست بالای داشته باشیم چنانچه هم داشتیم اما درد و دریغا که همه آرزوهای ما زریب سفر گردیم و نظام قوی قضایی کشور با قضرهای مسلکی و برزیدهش در بخصوص قضات زن در یک شبه از هم پاشید و متاسفانه که امروز تحصیل تجرب تبهار و سرنوش تمام قضات به خصوص قضات زن نالیده گرفته شد و حتی مهو گردید حالا میخوام در ارتباط به پرسی انتقال یک تعداد از قضات زن با فامیل هایشان به شمول بنده از افغانستان توسط نظامیان کشور پولند البته برهنمایی و امکاری خانم انا کرویشسکا و با هماهنگی انجمن بمللی قضات زن صحبت نماییم در قدم من خواست ازار سپاس و قرددانی می نماییم از رهبری دولت پولند نظامیان کشور پولند که در شرایط بسیار حساس و خیلی خطرناک برای قضات زن افغان پس از سقوط جمهوریت و کنترل افغانستان به دست طالبان که زندگی قضات بیشتر در خطر و تهدید بود اقدام فوری و بجا و به موقع نمودند زیرا از یک طرف موضوع ماهیت و هویت شغلی قضات زن افغان و از طرف دیگه ای که دروازه های زندان ها در سر سر افغانستان بدون در نظر داشته همه قوانین ملی و بین المللی باز شده و تمام افراد زندانی زندانی طالب و سایر جنایتکاران که توسط همکاران ما این قضات زن ماکمه و زندانی شده بودند راها شده و در پای ردیابی و انتقامگیری قضات برآمده بودند و چنانچه که امکان درسی به قضات هم برایشان میسر بود بنان هر لحظه ما قضات زن زیر تعدید و خطر مرگ قرار گرفته بودیم و همه ایمان از محلات مسکونی خود به خاطر نجات جان خود و اعضای فامیل خود تغییر مکان نموده بودیم بنان به تاریخ عبده اگست 2021 زمانی که یک نامه سفارت امریکا مقیم کابل به دست ما رسید ما کشور را به قصد رسیدن به امریکا و به خاطر نجات جان خود از سرس طالبان تر کنیم البته تصمیم گرفتیم تا از طریق میدان هوایی کابل خارج شیم اما متاسفانه که به یک وضعیت و حالت خیلی غیر نرمال متشنج و وحشتناک مواجه کردیم زیرا از یک طرف طالبان بالای مردم پر میکردن و از طرف دیگه هر لحظه گاز اشکاور پخش میکردن و اوضاع لحظه به لحظه بد و بدتر شده میره با این وضعیت تا سی روز دست و پنجه نمیدادیم اما بیشتر از آن قابل تعمل نبود زیرا به دروازه های متعدد دخلی میدان هوایی مراجعه کردیم با هزارها مشکل و خود به در اوزای ورودی رسانیدیم اما موفق به داخل شدن به داخل میدان هوایی نشدیم حتی در روزای در روز اخیر بسیار ناامید شده بودیم و در اون زمان فقط به این فکر میکردیم که چطور از بین این دود و آتش ما نجات پیدا کنیم و حتی تصمیم گرفته بودیم که دوباره به خانه های خود برگردیم که در همان اصنا از کمیته کاری انجمن بلملالی قضات زن مسیج دریافت نبودیم که حابی مطلب زیل بود یه خانم که وکیل مدافع است به نام انا کرویشتا در کشور پولند وعدی همکاری نموده و در همانگی با دولت پولند به نظامیان کشور پولند در کابل مسئولیت انتقال افغانهای 
همکار با دولت پولن را به عهده دارند ادعایت داده شده تا در زمینه انتقال یک تعداد قضات زن و فامیلایشان اقدام فوری نماید که واقعا تا یک برنامه ریزی بسیار دقیق و منظم نظامیان کشور پولن ما را مسئول به کشور خود انتقال دادند با گذشت زمان ما درک کردیم که دولت و نظامیان پولن خدماتی را انجام دادند که اصلا برای ما در آن شرط بحرانی قابل تصور نبود بالاخره به تاریخ 21 اگست 2021 و شهر وارسا رسیدیم و حداقل نفس راحت کشیدیم که ما هرگز از های میروان و آغوش باز مردم و کشور پولند جهت ورودمان به این کشور را فراموش نخواهیم کرد و بجاز که از در اینجا بنمایندگی از انجمن قضات زن افغانستان و انجمن به مللی قضات زن از همکاری رهبری کشور پولند نظامیان پولند و مردم به کشور پولند که دست به دست هم داده تا ما قضات زن با آن همه ترس و وحشت یک مکان مسون یا اقامتگاه امن پیدا کنیم حتی همکاران متذکره اوقات شخصی و فراغت خود را در اختیار ما قرار دادند و به مشکلات ما رسیدگی کردند و قابل ذکر میدانیم این که مردم پولند نه تنها که این وظیفه بشر دوستانه را به افغانستان بلکه به کشور اوکراین که فعلا ما میبینیم بیشتر از میلیون مردم اوکراین اینجا به حیث مهاجر آمده برشان رسیدگی میشه و در پولی ازی به یک تعداد دیگه هم مسیر داده میشه البته انتقال میشه به کشورهای اروپایی اروپای که یک وظیفه بسیار مقدس و واقعا یک وظیفه بشر دوستانه است که ما برشان مفقت آرزو میکنیم برخلاف امسایه افغانستان که با ما چی کردن تشکر از توجهتان امیدوار هستم که وضعیت افغانستان خوب شود Thank you, Judge, Judge Rasuli. Um, I will now introduce you to Judge Tayeba Parsa, a younger judge, a judge with equally amazing history. She is, uh, she was, I'm sorry, <laughs> she was a judge um, in the commercial division of the Appellate um, Court um, of Kabul province. And she was also communication officer for the Afghan Women Judges Association before Kabul fell. Judge Parsa is the one whose tweet started this whole affair. And thanks to her, actually, many judges were saved. She holds master's degree in criminal law and criminology. And she graduated from the Islamic Sharia Law School of Kabul University, in addition to having any other, you know, many other trainings from various other international organizations like Global Rights in, uh, Organization and Legal Aid. Judge Parsa became a lawyer to protect people's rights against various injustices and viol rampant violations and corruptions that is happening and was happening in the very corrupt legal system of Afghanistan. So she wanted to be a judge, but she wanted to be a good judge, not just any judge. So she, after graduation, she became an assistant to the judge in a civil and public rights division of the Supreme Court for one year to gain the experience. And thereafter, she joined a commercial, a commercial court where she worked as a judge for 10 years in different courts, including the commercial division of the Appellate Court of Kabul Province, civil division of the Primary Court of Kabul Province, public rights division, uh, primary commercial court, and civil and public rights division of the Supreme Court of Afghanistan. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, please see the very moving, in my opinion, and beautiful statement made, personal statement made by Judge Tayeba in the brochure that is listed on the website of both the Aguilanian Law Society and Kostyushka Foundation. So Judge Tayeba, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your nice words. If you don't mind, by your permission, I would like to read my uh, papers because I don't want to miss any point. Um, hello and greetings to everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to, the, to today's event. I'm so happy that I, uh, I have the chance to talk about uh, Polish help to us, Afghan women judges. And uh, because I believe it is the most successful example of uh, such humanitarian operations. And I uh, wish to talk about my reasons for this claim since I have been evacuated to Poland. Let me start a story from the time before Kabul fell. 
For 20 years, Afghan women judges courageously dedicated their lives to the rule of law, justice, and democracy. We were always a target of the Taliban's attacks and threats uh, for two crucial reasons. First, the Taliban believes that uh, women are not uh, allowed to work as judges. Second, many of the Taliban fighters involved in terrorism and have been put in jail by these women judges. Uh, we got disappointed when, the, when we witnessed that the Taliban were taking the provinces one by one. Uh, there was certainly a danger of being arrested, tried, and even executed for all of us. I reflected on this danger disappointed, disappointedly in my only inter interview to two days before uh, Kabul fell. When the Taliban took over all the provinces and we were expecting Kabul to fall every moment. Uh, when Kabul fell, uh, we're, we're assured of our uh, actual execution. I remember my sister uh, who lives abroad called me crying and saying, I cannot believe that we can, we cannot anything uh, for you except sitting and watching how you will die. For two days, I was hiding those necessary documents that show our identity and destroying the rest of them and our, our notes and books uh, disappointedly because trying to be independent as our job demands, we never had uh, connections with any embassies and political parties. So we did not have any uh, protection and way to escape to be uh, rescued. On the third day, it means uh, four days after my interview, I received a call from Polish lawyer, uh, from a Polish lawyer, uh, Anna Kruszewska. Uh, it was like a miracle. She read my interview, called, uh, called, uh, ju called Judge um, Dargis Colin, person who, who interviewed me. Uh, and found my contact number, she and her friends could manage to meet the high level Polish authorities, uh, chef of prime minister office, and requested him to help us within a couple of days. Uh, when the government of Poland was informed of our crucial situation, uh, re reacted quickly with a humanitarian operation of evacuation. When Anna said, we want to help you, uh, are you ready to leave? I didn't, I didn't think about anything. Did not ask any question and said yes. Uh, then I packed my bag and went to the airport with my family within 30 minutes. Uh, there was a huge crowd. And also the Taliban uh, on, on military vehicles before the gates did not allow anyone to the gates. Um, and they were firing and beating people to scatter the crowd. Uh, so it was impossible to enter to the airport. I want to thank the Polish mil military for their efforts and uh, metic meticulous planning of our evacuation. They directed all people who had flights to Poland uh, to a parking, a safe place near the airport, uh, where we could wait for a fair chance to go to the airport. Then we received an instruction that it was time to go to the gate. I mentioned, I mentioned detailed planning because as you may know, in, in other countries, evacuation may be people whose names were not on the list were able to enter the planes, but it didn't happen to our flights. In addition, we were treated very friendly and kindly. Although such behavior is not expected from military regularly. One of the Polish uh, soldiers who talked Persian tried to calm me down and find my father when he was lost in, in the crowd and finally brought him to me. Although we nine judges and our family members were evacuated by different planes to different refugee facilities, the government decided to collect all of us uh, and, their, uh, and our family members in one hotel, which was an appreciable and beneficial measure because uh, we were shocked and even depressed. In addition, we were provided with, with psychological, medical and legal services. Each of us uh, had two lawyers uh, who provided much legal advice. 
uh, we were granted residency documents in, in Poland within a brief period and were included in an integration program that, support, uh, uh, that supports us for one year. Polish authorities dedicated a unique project to the women judges. Uh, we were supported by financial help, accommodation, and Polish classes in, in, project, in the project. Uh, it was not only the Polish government that helped us. Uh, we also were impressed by, by Polish judges and lawyers and prosecutors' kind, kindness and humanitarianism. Uh, Polish judges who became aware of our location contacted us and drove uh, hours to visit us in a uh, refugee facility uh, far from Warsaw. Uh, they contributed many necessary materials, such as clothes and hygienic materials, and met us regularly by asking and providing for our needs. I want to express my gratitude, gratitude to Polish judges and lawyers who started a fundraising program by running to help us. It was impressive to see all the judges and lawyers run uh, on that day. Uh, a group of Polish judges from different courts came to the hotel to visit us and have a friendly talk. We had, we had lost uh, the jobs we loved, and uh, so we enjoyed sharing our experiences and discussing the differences between the Polish and Afghan judiciary systems. When they noticed how interested uh, we were in, in visiting Polish courts, they, they planned uh, some visits to Polish courts and trials that were so inspiring that we learned a lot from them. There's another group that helped us and, and I should take the opportunity to thank them. Polski Foundation Migration, who operated the project and Poznan University who, um, that provided us uh, with scholarships in cooperation with German institution named the Global Campus. I appreciate their efforts and hope, uh, hope the scholarships will lead us to regain our career and legal duties. At last, I would like to express my gratitude and, and appreciation, appreciation to the government of Poland for their humanitarian operation, the Polish military, uh, judges and lawyers, and, uh, and all the people involved in these humanitarian measures especially Anna Khrushchevska. Uh, she could not be apathetic uh, when she heard my voice from a country away. She proved how effective an individual, a woman could be and, and that uh, we should not expect valuable organizations to react to a crisis. When the Polish operation was done, uh, Anna didn't stop yet and uh, she wasn't satisfied still. Anna um, didn't give up and again ad advocated for us and requested, uh, requested her Romanian friends. Uh, and as a result, they, uh, Romania evacuated uh, seven more judges and, and a, a court clerk and their family members whose lives were in danger through an uh, appreciation. Appreciate appreciable operation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Judge Parsa. Thank you You're for welcome. everything you did. It's admirable. So let me introduce now, introduce you now to our last speaker, last but not least, Nigara Mirdat Omar. She is a senior diplomat, a lawyer, and a deputy head mission of the Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan in Warsaw. She is a seasoned diplomat with a long experience in serving in a number of key positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Among other, among many of her many experiences, she was a Deputy General and the Head of China Section, Secretary of Afghanistan Embassy and Permanent Mission in Geneva, Switzerland, Head of the Political and Economic Section of the Islamic Republic Embassy um, in Paris, uh, Officer Desk on Iran, and a member of the second political department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ms. Omar holds bachelor's degree in international law from the Tajik National State University. And she's also a graduate of the Institute of Diplomacy um, where she earned a high degree in 2010. She speaks many languages, including Russian, alongside with many 
national languages, and she has been a key player in many international events and bilateral negotiations. And she is currently working without pay in Afghanistan embassy in Poland, because of course she's carrying her duties regardless of the fact that she is not, uh, Taliban doesn't support the uh, embassy in Warsaw any longer. They haven't appointed any other diplomats, but Afghan people still needs the consular support. And therefore here she is doing her duties without pay. So we are honored to welcome you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind words. First, I would like to thank the organizer for the timely and important uh, webinars uh, and giving me uh, this opportunity and honor to speak among you. Uh, and also on behalf of the um, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan here in Warsaw, I highly appreciate all uh, efforts uh, supporting Afghanistan peoples. And a special thanks to Anna and her teams um, who has been supporting uh, tirelessly from the beginning of evacuation Afghanistan judges up to now. Uh, on the 15th of August, uh, the gears start uh, and uh, Poland uh, withdrew from, uh, however, Poland withdrew from Afghanistan in 2014. Uh, but I witnessed uh, the government and the people of uh, Poland um, were among the first angels who took the risk and uh, followed to Kabul and rescued uh, people. Uh, the operation was uh, were successful and uh, hundreds of lives changed. Uh, they arrived in Poland and uh, overnight and the day following they were in a uh, when they were wake up, but no fear. Uh, the rest of operation were talks, weeks and, and months. And uh, however, uh, uh, you know, they cannot um, believe that they are in a safe hands, uh, no more bombs and killing. Uh, here, once again, uh, the, the history will record it. You know, uh, the, the history will record it that here is a still greatness nation who are care about uh, humanitarian uh, violence. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, within nine months, they got a normal life and the children back to schools. And uh, many, um, but in many other their family and friends in Afghanistan with no security, no foods, and no schools in their homeland. Unfortunately, they are the, they are the Taliban consider themselves as a base uh, people in the world. Uh, and, uh, I, I remember from the one year how much the people of Afghanistan learn about Poland. And I believe that hundreds of hearts beating and laugh when they are called Poland, when they called Poland. And uh, uh, from now, uh, I will uh, mention again, the history will remember the, the, the people and the nations who are sacrificed for the human being and who are genocides their own countrymen. And uh, I interviewed many uh, children when they are evacuated from Afghanistan in August last uh, year. And uh, they have been, uh, they told me that they have been uh, rescued from Taliban, uh, that they, they wanted to kill us. Uh, this means a lot, you know, they, it is uh, stuck on their, their minds. Uh, we have, uh, we have achieved in the uh, past 20 years uh, in following uh, achievement with support of international uh, community. Uh, I want to mention here a few of them. Uh, we had 20 pers 27 person of uh, member of our parliament were a family. Uh, more than 5 million girls uh, were going to the school and university. Uh, we had more than uh, eight ministers and ambassadors. Uh, we had more than 6,000 uh, female members and security forces. 
uh, women and girls uh, had significant role in the labor market and society and many other uh, enterprises like restaurant, taxi company uh, were running by the women and it was growing very fast. Uh, at the international level, our girls uh, team uh, delighted in uh, robotic, uh, music, sports, and also in our, uh, in the first time in our history, we had uh, uh, judges in our, female judges in our court. Uh, but now, uh, what is happening right now in Afghanistan in the most serious women rights crisis right now today in Afghanistan in the world. Uh, the list of the, the list of Taliban violation uh, of the right of women and girls is it is long and growing. They, they want secondary education uh, for the girls, want women from almost all the jobs. Uh, they blocked women to uh, to travel in long distance and leaving the country alone. Uh, they lost, the women in Afghanistan right now lost almost the basic rights and they, they attacked the, the women protesters, uh, embraced it, even killed, uh, but uh, I don't know, the, the, everything is not from our culture, from our regional, they, interview, they introduced for the people, the new Islamic, uh, that the people don't know about it. Uh, but uh, what we want from you and from the international community, uh, uh, as you know, the women who are inside of Afghanistan and they are every day protesting for their rights on the streets in front of the military, uh, the military uh, men, and they are. Uh, they want to uh, work, they want to go to schools, but we want to support their wives. We want to support our women, our judges, our, uh, all the women, because these all achievements uh, that we had from the 20 years, it was supported by international community, by your supports, and it should be supported as well to not uh, stop, do not let the history should stop here. And uh, when, uh, uh, what is, from the, from the, when the Taliban took over the Kabul, I, I see many statements, but with no results. Uh, but uh, we need to save our, our achievements, our 20 years of achievements. Uh, otherwise, you know, we need to have a normal governments, and otherwise, uh, in, in, we will have another millions of tourists under the Taliban rule. And uh, you know, more than six hundred square meter kilometers will facilitate opium uh, cultivation, and uh, it will uh, it will encourage military corps and non democratic governments in the region and beyond. And what is the uh, the situation is right now in Afghanistan? It is horrible, you know, especially for the women uh, who are living inside. As you know, on seven of May, the new statement that the new role of the Taliban that they asked women to cover their face and do not even wear the colorful clothes. This is, I, I, I don't know why the world watching this, this history, this drama, this, the, the serials, and it should be a stop, I think, because the, the, the women cannot live anymore under their controls. Every day they, they beat them, they kill them, and uh, there is no, the, um, uh, as you know, we had, uh, we had, uh, very uh, and our media were, were, was uh, very uh, free free and now we don't have any freedom media uh, but we don't know what what is happening in, in that country because they, they do not they do not allow the journalists to go and uh, took an interview with anyone uh, 
uh, as you read, as you heard, maybe in the north of Afghanistan, it is about more than one week. The, there is a military resistance, and they are fighting with the Taliban. But there is not any report about uh, the, the attacked civilian. They killed the women, children, and and civilian. But there is no report. Uh, we we want from the international community to support our wives and stand for with the women uh, who wants uh, their, uh, their rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nigara. That's, that's wonderful. So now is the time for our Q&A sessions. We have some questions that have come in. And let me direct the first question to Judge Anissa Rasuli. Um, I have read many interviews with Judge Rasuli preparing for this um, webinar. And let me tell you two quotes which I found so touching. One quote of Judge Rasuli is this, not all women in Afghanistan are women in blue burqas begging. We are also best engineers, doctors, judges, and teachers. And then the second quote from Judge Rasuli, my wish for all women is to enjoy human rights to which they are entitled as human being, beings. Much depends on eliminating violence against women and factors behind it. But I believe that if we work with international community, we will solve this problem. So, Judge Rasuli, how do you think the situation of Afghan women or Afghan judges, especially in Afghan professional women, looks today? Um, What's I the hope? Um, um, تشکر از سوالتان در ارتباط با وضعیت والد قضات زن وقتی که خانم نگاره همه موضوعات در ارتباط با خانم ها گفتن شما قیاس کنین که وضعیت حالت قضات زن در افغانستان در کدام وضعیت است واضح است من براتون قبلا هم گفتم که زندانی ها تمام تمام زندان های افغانستان در وضعش باز شد و همچنان در پلو از او طالب خودش دشمن قاضی زن بود در مجموع تمام قضات به خصوص قاضی زن واضح هست که اصلا زنایی که قاضی هستند در افغانستان زندگی میکنن بسیار به شکل و گمنام زندگی میکنن و تا حد امکان کوشش میکنن که نه و مکس که قاضی زن در کجا زندگی میکنه با هم خاطر زندگیشان بسیار دچار مشکلات و وضعیتشان بسیار خراب است نه تنها قاضی زن حتی بر سایر زنای تاثیر کرده هم دیگه جای بر افغانستان مانده مگر که جامعه ملل بر ما توجه بکنه و حد اقل دوباره بر احقاق حق زنا کار کنه در افغانستان Uh, uh, I'm translating uh, her nice words. Uh, she said, as uh, Nagara John mentioned uh, and described uh, the situation of women in Afghanistan right now after Taliban came. Uh, uh, compare yourself uh, uh, the situation of uh, women, especially women judges. You can uh, imagine yourself when uh, the when the Taliban came. They opened uh, the gates of the prisons and uh, released all the prisoners and uh, criminals, serious criminals. Uh, and also uh, hmm, uh, the Taliban, uh, Taliban members uh, themselves uh, were enemy of the women judges. Uh, they, they have, they, uh, have problem with, with all judges, especially women judges who put in jail their colleagues and, and uh, uh, Taliban members who were involved in terrorism attacks and bomb explosions. And uh, right now, uh, judges who, who were working in these courts are in hiding, they are in bad situation and they, they uh, hide their identity. Um, mm, and uh, not only uh, women judges, but also all uh, women in Afghanistan are, uh, they are, are deprived from their basic rights. And uh, so we want the international community to, to uh, support them, to help them. Uh, 
regain their basic rights. Thank you. Thank you. So, Judge uh, Judge Tayeba, may I ask you a question now? There are several okay. questions that has come in, um, but the question that I would like to ask you is, um, what's your hope as a young judge who was, you know, whose life radically changed so much, a judge with so much courage <laughs> to tweet in conditions like it was described? What's your hope and you know, what kind of help do you expect from Poland? Um, how do you feel in Poland? Um, what's your what's your hope for future as a judge? Um, as a I hope, uh, I hope um, one day Afghanistan, uh, again in Afghanistan, uh, rule of law and justice, democracy govern again. And uh, I hope all the women judges who are left in Afghanistan uh, receive protection and support from international community. Uh, I actually ask international community and also all the governments to help them to safely leave Afghanistan and uh, for right now. But uh, and also help all uh, judges who left Afghanistan with the scholarships and uh, and visas because some of them are in bad uh, situation in Abu Zabi in uh, refugee camps uh, waiting for a uh, visa of their final destination. And, um, uh, and I hope all of us, all the lawyers, uh, professionals who left Afghanistan, uh, um, uh, do not get disappointed, do not give up and uh, try to rebuild uh, their lives, to, to try to build their capacity and use this tough time to, to build their capacity. And I hope one day uh, we women judges can bring uh, the rule of law and, and democracy and justice back to the people of Afghanistan. Thank you, Judge Barsa. You're welcome. Um, let me ask the final um, the question that I that, that is in my mind to to uh, Miss uh, Nigara Mirdat. Um, how do you think women of Afghanistan? What can they do right now? I mean, we know the Taliban just introduced the law that women cannot leave without male assistance, cannot leave the house, that they cannot be they have to be completely covered. The only thing that can be seen is their eyes behind the veil. These are extreme measures to to subdue women. They, they cannot go to schools, the girls cannot go to schools, women cannot work. Um, I assume that there is no access to justice any longer for, for women. Uh, we know that the recent law states that, you know, if the woman doesn't comply, it's the men who will be punished. Therefore, this is a huge potential for abuse, domestic violence, and all kinds of other untoward consequences. So my question is, what can women who are left in Afghanistan do, if anything at all? In fact, yesterday we just received an email from a female prosecutor, no, female prosecutor, yes, uh, which is in grave danger and, and asking for any help to evacuate her because there was an attack on her. She was greatly injured by some kind of Taliban. Uh, I don't know what exactly happened, but she's, you know, and they are women in great danger right now. And what can Afghan women do, realistically speaking? Are they the future that will, you know, defeat Talib Taliban? Uh, I think uh, first uh, the, the international community and the French country uh, help them who wants to, who is in dangerous lives in Afghanistan and who wants to leave the country, help them to leave the country. Uh, first of all, at second, uh, it is not easy to to leave the country. Uh, I'm in this. Uh, you know, it is uh, very hard for me to take a decision to leave my work right now. As you know, as you mentioned, that it, it is nine months uh, nine months that I'm working with a, without any salary. Uh, in the same times, I had a good chance to to take an asylum seeker in Poland or here in the neighbor country in Germany. But but it is not easy for the for the women that who are educated and who had a dream to work for their countries and uh, to uh, see their futures in the countries to leave the country. But if they are in very dangerous situation, first of all, I uh, ask to the uh, international community and the French country help them to leave the country and otherwise. 
crush the, the Taliban to allow the, the girls to go to these schools and allow them to work, uh, to work because uh, many of the women in Afghanistan, they do not, they do not have a, a man in their family. And they, they were uh, a worker of, uh, uh, by themselves. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the reality of film, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but but I, I wish that the international community pushed the Taliban to, to uh, respect the women's rights. And uh, first, the, uh, I asked the US they, because they signed the agreement with the Taliban and the Taliban uh, committed in this agreement that they will respect the women's rights. And now this is, they should uh, show it in action and respect the women's rights. And, and the, the second, um, I, I want from the international community to ask the Taliban to make an inclusive government uh, because it is not important. This is not, and now it is not impossible that they can uh, run the government with, with this uh, rule that they are now action. It's not uh, possible to, to the country, uh, Afghanistan, and without any uh, respect women rights, it's, it's not possible. Thank you. Thank you. Let me finish with the question for Anya from Veselas Kuszewska, that is. Um, uh, all of us, or most of us, watched the fall of Kabul. We all watched it on TV. We were in horror. And not all of us did what you did. Um, you were the one who went on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever it was that you went on or WhatsApp. You connected the people, you make it happen. How did you do it? Because you know, there are so many people who watched it, millions of people watched this in horror, and nobody did anything. Well, thank you for this difficult question, <laughs> actually, to answer because um, well, let me start by saying that um, first of all, as um, as a person who believes in God, I think that was his setup that I was set up for the job. That's the first thing, and um, it was just. Uh, but uh, other than that, I think um, this story proves that that you should take an action. That you can. Uh, you don't. You should not second what you, you can do, but just try it. I didn't know if we're going to succeed, if the if Polish government would listen to this appeal. I didn't know if anyone would answer my emails without thinking that I'm actually insane. But I did it because I thought there's nothing to lose and there are only things to gain. And this story proves that, that in fact, you can do more then you think you would be ever capable of if you are willing to try. And of course, it, it could fail as well, but I think um, we are capable of, like as a human beings, for more than we can imagine if we believe in, in a good reason to act and seeing what's going on in Afghanistan and understanding the risk of Afghan female judges made me very determined. And I felt that this is a call for action. And to be honest, I also have been watching Afghan female situation for years before. And I was always inspired, and always full of respect to female, um, to women in Afghanistan. Because I, I know I've, I've read a lot about the situation so in a situation like that, I didn't hesitate to try. I didn't know how it's going to end. Really, I didn't know, um, but I tried. And sometimes it's enough to try. Thank you, Anu. So I think, I think we have to kind of close and come to end because the time is unfortunately. Um, I want to thank all of the participants Today we heard the story of Afghan women who basically trusted the promise of democracy, the rule of law, the human rights, 
And despite of all that, they have been left in a very dire situation. But we also heard the story of this amazing human solidarity of one woman helping another woman, of judges helping judges, of this kind of traditional Polish solidarity with those in need born out of tragic Polish history. So I want to thank Anna. I want to thank judges Rasuli and Parsa for being so brilliant, courageous. I want to thank Ms. Nigara Omar, the head mission of the, of the Afghan embassy for doing what she's doing in continuing to do. And I also want to thank for Mr. Kujana and Ms. Muga, Ms. Muga for doing the airlift with such great urgency and skills. For uh, want to thank the Polish Ministry for Foreign Affairs for supporting these efforts and those Polish soldiers who bravely dare to abandon the safety of the airport to extract the judges risking their own life. And I want to end it with a call for action. As President Kennedy said, as Anya said, as many people have said, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. Um, and my call for second call for action is, we have new crises, it seems every day. It's not just Afghanistan, it's Ukraine. Now there are so many human tragedies, but I hope that the fate of Afghan women is not gonna be forgotten, that we will not forget that that their rights are being under attack. And in fact, women rights everywhere seem to be under attack. So uh, I want to thank our speaker one more time for being here, for being courageous to tell us their stories, for everything they did. And I know that I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that we greatly respect and admire and thank you for your actions. So with all of that, I thank our audience for being here and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Judge uh, Anissa said. Uh, I, want, I would like to thank you all. I was so happy. It was a great session. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. We will post thank the video so on the website so we'll be able to see it. And we will post whatever materials we can post on both the and Law Society and Kostyushka Foundation. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you.